original super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. I hope you're doing well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional homestead living, traditional raw milk products, and artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. Today, I want to talk about cheese making. We have four different types of cheese, and I'm working on a fifth. I am so glad the small cheese cave is nearing completion, so we will have a place to store all of them. If you are new to the podcast, welcome. It is great to have you. And a shout out to the veteran homestead loving regulars who stop by the farmcast for every episode. You all make this show possible. I have so much exciting news this week. Let's get to it. So cheese, this week I made an absolutely fabulous cheddar. Well, it looks, so far it looks good. Uh, Sometimes we have trouble getting the cheese to come together and close up solidly on the outside rind. So there are no holes there on the outside. So that's been a problem for us in the past. And it's important if you have opening on the surface of the cheese, unwanted mold can get inside and ruin the whole cheese. And this is the first cheddar that I've made this season, and I am well pleased with it. We made three really giant uh, cheddar wheels last year. They were over 25 pounds each. And man, did we have trouble getting those closed. I ended up using extra wax on those to help keep any unwanted molds out from out from getting inside of that cheese. You know, and cheese making, cheese making is such a pleasant experience Uh, it's time consuming you need to be able to slow your mind down because you're slowly stirring and there's slow steps to it Uh, you're slowly heating the milk up and then you add culture and then you wait and then you add a coagulating uh, agent and then you wait and then you can cut and start cooking it and and then after that you know you you get into uh, various different methods of making a cheese this one used a cheddaring process the last one actually there was no special process on the last one uh that was the pinnacle but before that uh i was making Ararat legend and that one is a washed curd cheese and also the havarti style uh peaceful heart gold is also a washed curd cheese so that's a specific specific method that's used during the cooking process before it gets uh, pressed and the cheddar is salted differently than any of the other cheeses as well it's it's a, a dry salting where the other three kinds of cheese that I'm making go into a brine and then the it's a really salty water that then just gets sucked into the inside of the cheese so that's uh, that's a little bit about the the cheese making that I've been doing and I started off cheese making with creating a new cheese this year and the first wheel is nearly ready for tasting uh, it's a tome style cheese and it has a natural rind now tome is, is used to describe it's a generic group of cheeses that are produced mainly in the French Alps and in the Swiss Alps uh, this cheese is lower in fat than our other cheeses. It's it's made in a circular mold. It has an earthy gray brown natural rind, uh, and hopefully it will have an intensely nutty taste. So this is my first foray into creating this type of natural rind, and this again is something I'm going to be able to do much easier once we get the cheese cave going. Uh, it was quite the task uh, this time but I I have all these small plastic containers because the humidity has to be really high I cannot have low humidity I can't just throw some wax on it to keep it from drying out if I want a natural rind I need that humidity in the air so one other thing about these last cheeses that I made um, I I call them Stuart Jack so they're uh, similar to a Monterey Jack style cheese it's a, it's a tome style cheese, but it's going to be 
hopefully come out uh, more like uh, a jack cheese. So additionally, in, in the last three cheeses that I experiment, experiment, experimented with, I was adding in wasabi to the curds. Uh, at one point, I think I added it to the milk to see what that, what that would do. But to, a couple of them, I added them directly to the curds. And I think the last one that I made, it looked like the best one with the added wasabi. So we shall see. Is it going to have a nice, sharp wasabi bite to it? I don't know. We shall see. You know, it's like, how much do I use? Where do I put it in in the process? All of that is, is kind of experimentation at this point. And it right now with my cheese making, the, the way that it's going to work for the entire cheese season is that I will do a regular rotation alphabetically. And I start with making Ararat Legend, uh, which I will be making, I think, no, I made that right before I made the Claudeville cheddar, right? So I did I did the Claudeville cheddar. So first the Ararat Legend, that's the Dutch style, uh, Gouda, Dutch Gouda style cheese. And then the cheddar, Claudeville cheddar. The pinnacle will come next after that, or maybe not. Maybe it'll be Peaceful Heart Gold. I forget which one of those comes first. But anyway, the pinnacle is a Swiss Gruyere style cheese, and Peaceful Heart Gold is a Danish Havarti style cheese. Uh, so, and um, yeah, so all of these cheeses that I'm making this year are going to go into the small cheese cave. That's where all of this wonderful cheese will be aged to perfection. So let me talk about the cheese cave. Our new creamery features two cheese caves. One is large enough to handle an entire year's worth of cheese when we are at full production, somewhere between six and ten cows. All of the cheeses we make are aged cheeses. Uh, the legal requirement is that they be aged 60 days, but that, that's actually not enough even for our cheeses. The, the earliest any of our aged cheeses are are ready to go is three months and most of them it's more like six to nine months before it's a, a really good cheese and ready to go so that means we have them in the aging cave for a very long time when we're in full production the large cheese cave will have lots and lots of cheese in it all the time in varying stages of aging now at the present time scott is trying to get the smaller cave ready for us to use uh for the cheeses that we're making this year. We're not at full production, so this smaller cheese cave is going to be excellent. It will be a blessing to have more room and greater control of the temperature and humidity. Now, I think last time I said, at first Scott was not going to put the tiles on the floor, but recently he changed his mind. Uh, last podcast I said he would put it into use without the floor, but life changes daily on the homestead. <laughs> This cave will have wooden shelves to house the cheese. So these shelves are held up with cinder blocks. So you put the cinder blocks down, then you put the wood down, then you put another layer of cinder blocks down, you know, spaced out. I don't know how far apart they'll be. Um, with In between the cinder blocks is where the cheese will lay on that wood. And then it just goes up. I don't know how many shelves high that it will go up. But anyway, that... Uh, I believe his reasoning on going ahead with the floor tiles now rather than later was the daunting task of taking all that apart to do the floor later. So he's gonna he's he's working on getting those tiles glued down now as I speak. Uh, now the grout between the tiles will come later. It it has to be a special grout that we're ordering uh, that can withstand a dramatic alkaline and or acid fluctuations and harsh cleaning compounds. Uh, so this is a special grout we'll be using throughout the creamery. Fortunately, we learned about the necessity for this based on someone else's issue. Um, there's a lovely dairy about an hour away from us, Meadow Creek Dairy. They milk about 200 cows and make lots and lots of cheese. They are pretty much 100% wholesaling their cheese now. They make like 20 times more than we ever plan on making. And originally they started out just like us, going to farmer's markets and selling to local stores. Um, now they sell wholesale cheese internationally. They even had one of their cheeses featured at a White House dinner. That's been some years back. Uh, somewhere in the 2000 aught something days uh, time frame. I know that Scott would probably prefer, not probably, he would prefer working on completing the roof. But his priority is getting that cheese cave functional. And he's nearly there. And after that, 
nothing will hold him back from finishing the entire roof. Uh, so getting uh, the other roof framing up and then getting the felt on there and then the metal that goes over all of the entire roof will happen after that. And, and I don't know what he plans after that. I'll let you know when he lets me know what comes after that. Now let's get into some of the animals, the lambs. We have new lambs. Our first lamb, well, our first scheduled lamb was born on May 7th. There is one lamb that was the first. Uh, it was born the first week of February. And the unplanned one that resulted from one of our oopsie moments, we moved the animals around and somehow one of last year's ram lambs got sorted in with the girls. Fortunately, only one unplanned birth. Anyway, May 7th was the first planned one, and now we have six all together, five new ones, and then the one that was born a couple, three months ago. Uh, we have three more ewes that still need to have their lambs. Now, so far, we have four singles and one set of twins. And from the round look of the still pregnant ewes, we are on a path to have two more sets of twins out of those three that are still to give birth. They are really, really round. And there have been no issues with any moms or lambs so far. We have no bottle lambs. Usually there's something happens with a mom or with a lamb, but uh, last year we had just one, and so far this year, knock on wood, we haven't had any. But the mom of this year's twins had triplets last year. And one of them just wasn't getting enough milk and attention. On day two or three, we found him shivering and a little weak. Uh, and she really wasn't letting him get nursing with her. And one of the other two out of the three was really big. And I think he was just really hogging all of the milk for the most part. Anyway, I scooped him up and I brought him inside and I got him warmed up. It took a little while to find the bottles and the lamb milk replacer. You know, you've always got some on hand, but you got to dig it out. But I soon ha had some warm milk in him. We had to keep an eye on him several times a day for a few days, but eventually he perked up, and he is now in line to be our herd ram. Uh, we call him Lambert. So it looks like no triplets this year. And as I said, so far, no bottle feeding. I don't know. Bottle feeding is really kind of fun, but. I don't know. It's just one more thing to do also. Now, the cows are giving us plenty of milk. Uh, we are doing herd shares with our uh, raw milk for our local folks here. And we had our cows tested for A2A2 genetics, and about half the herd is certified A2A2. So we have plenty of milk to uh, fulfill that. And over the next few years, we will be moving to 100% A2A2 genetics. Now, if you're not familiar with what that means... I have a previous podcast on the topic. It's called, What is A2A2 Milk? And I'll put a, a link in the show notes. Or you can go to the website and click or tap on the podcast menu item. I recorded that one nearly a year ago. So scroll down a little way and you'll, you'll find it. I also have lots of good information on why we drink raw milk and lots of other information about raw milk. Uh, we love it. We absolutely love it. And the A2A2 is a is a genetic trait that is being asked for by a lot of people. So that's why we're going to go ahead and fulfill that need. Our heritage breed Normandies are, uh, most of them are naturally A2A2 uh, genetics, but not all of them. So I do have a couple of those that we're going to have to eventually cull out of the herd. But uh, the... You might even see this A2A2 milk that is in the grocery stores. It originated in Australia, and uh, it has come a long, long way since then. I don't want to get into too many details on that. I did that again on the What is A2A2 Milk uh, podcast last year. And all of our cheese and dairy products are based in raw milk. In Virginia, that means if you want these products, you need to own your own cow. If it's your cow, you can have anything you want out of it. And we offer the opportunity for folks to buy into our herd via our herd share program. And you pay a fee to get into the homestead herd and then a monthly service fee, uh, depending on how 
much that you're buying into will determine how much product you get, you know, like a gallon of milk a week or a quarter pound of cheese a week, you know, depending on what it is that you want. But there's a monthly service fee for that, and then we do the rest. And you can pay for extra services also if you like extra stuff. So we have lots of great people enjoying our milk, cheese, yogurt, and butter. And by the way, if you know of anyone in the Winston-Salem, North Carolina area that's looking for these kinds of nutritious products, let them know about us. We can't deliver to them across state lines, but they can certainly come to the farm and pick up their milk or butter or whatever. And we welcome our North Carolina neighbors into our herd share program. As long as you're picking it up in Virginia, you're good to go. Now, our quail babies, they grow so fast. There's a couple of nice videos on our Facebook page, if you go in there, where Scott has one when they were just a day or two old, and then he has one that he took yesterday, I think, where they were nearly two weeks old, and they're just fully feathered. And they're two or three, I would say they're three or four times the size that they were in two weeks. They grow so fast. Uh, We took their heat lamp away and and they're getting acclimated to keeping themselves warm without the additional heat that the lamp provided. And I believe tomorrow is their debut in the cages outside. It's been a bit too chilly to put them out there uh, yet, even though they have all their feathers on. But the, the temps are changing tomorrow. And once they are acclimated and able to kind of keep themselves warm, then they will be fine. Their parents survived the entire winter and did very well. Sometimes I'm surprised by the hardiness of barely domesticated animals. Quail in the wild have always been born and lived outside their entire lives. You know, nature's tough. So they'll be fine out there. They'll enjoy it out there. I think they'll have a lot more space than what they have right now. Now, yesterday I spent quite a bit of time in the garden. We have this lovely ground cover on all of the beds, and Scott built this raised bed garden out of uh, cinder blocks. They're actually concrete blocks. Uh, Three years ago, I think it's been. Um, And each year we have lots of trouble with weeds, as everyone does with their gardens. But I have this lovely raised bed garden that was causing me a lot of grief because of the amount of weeds. And and it because it's so large and it's just me for the most part managing it. So we are using this ground cover on all of the beds. And then there are places where the seeds go in the ground that are clearly marked. And then there's a hole being cut in the fabric to allow the seed to go in and then the leaves to come out once the seeds sprout. But everything else is covered by this ground cloth. So they've got the space that they need uh, between each plant. They've got some good solid composted soil down there underneath but that uh, dark landscape cloth will keep other things from actually growing the only thing that's going to be able to grow is what comes up through that hole so i'm hoping that's going to be a lot easier to take care of Um, if the system works we it will simplify gardening for us you know as again we weeds are a problem for every gardener And we just have too much else going on to spend a whole lot of time battling weeds. So we hope this cover is the answer that we've been looking for to bring joy back to gardening. And it will be at least another week or two, perhaps, before I plant my tomatoes and peppers out in the garden. Currently, they reside in my living room with grow lights over them. In a normal year, I would have been planting them out in the garden already but this year it's been a quite a cool spring we actually had a frost uh, day a day or two ago typically our last frost date is april 15th that was three weeks ago oh well as a homesteader we roll with the punches and each year is unique so i've got lots of tomatoes and peppers and i've got herbs i've got a few onions and what is the other oh herbs i have all kinds of, of culinary herbs and celery celery that was the other thing i wanted to say this is my second year growing celery i'm really excited about it last year the cows ate it before i harvested it so that was really disappointing but it was uh, quite tasty now the fruit situation is interesting on the bank just outside of the main garden is a bed of strawberries and at each end are alpine strawberries one has red strawberries and at the other end is yellow strawberries and then uh, in the middle is an ever-bearing variety that we got at Lowe's. I don't remember exactly the variety. 
Now that bed is overrun again with weeds. We were going to put the landscape cloth there as well, but haven't gotten around to it. And the result is weeds overrunning the strawberry bed. It is a never ending battle. But those alpine stra uh, strawberries are, are coming along really nicely. They're about mm, probably nearly as big as the tip of my thumb. Um, and they're very tasty, sweet and tasty. Now on the bright side regarding fruit, the blueberries bloomed nicely and should bear some great fruit in about a month. And the blackberries are blooming. It is one of my favorite times of the spring season because blackberry blossoms and wild rose blossoms fill the air with a lovely fragrance. So our blackberries, the wild blackberries and the wild roses, it's just, it's lovely. Uh, it, the air it just smells so great. The blackberries will be ripe about mid-July just after the four probably the week after the fourth of july if you're interested in picking your own blackberries let me know i can arrange a time for you to come out and fill up a bucket or two we have so many blackberries and i already have so much jam stored that uh and some frozen so you know i'm i'll be um, offering that as a you pick this year well, I'm sure I left out something. There's so much that happens in a day and time flies when you're living the life and having fun. But here's my final thoughts. Uh, I'll keep you up to date on how the cheese cave turns out next week. I hope to have more lamb births to announce and who knows what else will happen in the coming days. I hope you all can safely get back to work soon and get on with your lives. I cannot imagine what it must be like for you. Your lives upended. I hope my tales of the homestead are entertaining for you during this confined and uncertain time at home. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hop over to Apple Podcasts, subscribe, give me a five-star rating and a review. The, that helps the algorithms for them to recommend the podcast to others. And the best thing you can do to help out the show is to share it with any friends or family who might be interested in this type of content. Thank you so much for stopping by the homestead. And until next time. May God fill your life with grace and peace.